Like everyone else, our plans have been upended over the past few weeks, but I hope that you're well and that this episode will help you escape from the bleak news for an hour or so. A warm welcome to a new episode of Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Dynamic Room, the visual historians bringing the past back to life. Hello, I'm Peter Moore. Today we're heading back to the year 1941 to see one of the most charming spies of the century at work in the most dangerous of times. Two events in 1941 did more than anything else to settle the shape and eventual outcome of the Second World War. The first was the most fateful decision of Adolf Hitler's life, the launching of Operation Barbarossa against the USSR on the 22nd of June. The second was the surprise Japanese aerial attack on the US naval base of Pearl Harbor, six months later on the 7th of December. These events appear crystal clear to us in retrospect, but for many living at the time, they came like a flash out of the blue. A few people though, did know what was coming. One of them was one of the most extraordinary communist underground operatives of the 20th century, Ricard Zorge. Zorge ran a Soviet spy group in Tokyo from the 1930s onwards that achieved astonishing access into the Nazi war machine. A drinker, a womanizer, a risk taker, all on a breathtaking scale. One journalist has classified Zorge as an example of the rare species we might call homo undercoverus. Those who find the dull, unclassified lives that the rest of us lead simply not worth living. Our guest on Travels Through Time today is Owen Matthews, the author of a breathless and brilliant new biography of Zorge. Owen studied modern history at Oxford. His book, Stalin's Children, was translated into 28 languages and it was shortlisted for the Guardian First Book Award. Just before we were locked down in London, I managed to meet Owen at the Garrick Club in the West End. I hope you enjoy our conversation. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today, Owen. Great pleasure to be here. Owen, broadly, tell me a little bit about the life of Richard Zorga. Well, Zorga was a very bad man in many ways, who was a very brilliant spy. He was the spy to end all spies, according to John le Carre. Um, Kim Philby said his work was impeccable. Ian Fleming said he was the most formidable spy in history. Even the prosecutor who investigated and ultimately had him condemned at the end of his spy career, the Japanese prosecutor who interrogated him, called Zorga the greatest man I have ever met. He was extremely effective as a spy. The information that he transmitted to his Soviet masters arguably changed the history of the world. But at the same time, he was an extraordinarily flawed man. He systematically deceived every single person around him. There was, for nine years, no single human being with whom Richard Zorge actually had a full, frank relationship. And in that sense, actually, I think he has, um, we talked about Homo Undercoverus. There is something about him that is strongly resonant with other great spies like Kim Philby. Um, this almost pathological compulsion to deceive. Mm -hmm. He put it to very good use because he was able to thoroughly convince a large circle of German diplomats in Tokyo of his bona fides, that he was one of them and was able to access the deepest secrets of the German embassy in Tokyo and thereby lay bare the German war plans concerning Russia. But he was also able to motivate a group of Japanese agents, in fact, as we now know, more or less under various types of false flags, to work for him and do a similar job on their own Japanese counterparts. So the spiring that, that resulted in this sort of pathological behavior was one of the most impressive and one of the most influential that the, the espionage world has ever known. Yeah, the, I think probably the best way of us categorizing how impressive and qualifying your claim there is your observation that he was one degree of separation from Joseph Stalin, 
one degree of separation from Adolf Hitler and one degree of separation from the Japanese Prime Minister. Is that correct? Exactly. Because at the height of his powers, Zorge's closest personal friend and um, confidant was Eugen Ott, uh, Major General Eugen Ott, who was, from 1939 onwards, the German ambassador to Imperial Japan. And Ott regularly spoke in person to Adolf Hitler. Zorge was reporting on a weekly basis to his superiors in Moscow, uh, the head of the fourth department of the Soviet general staff, who was speaking on a daily basis to Stalin. And Zorge's best agent, a Japanese communist uh, journalist called Hotsumi Ozaki, had pursued the career path that some journalists pursue, which is from from correspondent to expert to think tanker to government advisor. So again, by that crucial moment in 1941, Ozaki is a member of the so-called breakfast group, and he's having breakfast uh, on a daily basis with uh, the prime minister and his closest advisors. So yes, indeed, Ricard Zorge is at the centre of this uh, of the, this. This spiraling and at the centre of his personality, well, in the centre of this story, more than his personality, I suppose, is this this idea that he was very successful. We've qualified that. You've shown that to be the case. But at the same time, he was not successful in a way you'd, you'd imagine you could be because he was quite chaotic. He lived in a very reckless way. He lived on the edge. All the things that probably today we're trained to think are, you know, are actually detrimental to your chances of being successful he managed to bring together in this quite extraordinary personality which flourished. I think it's really worth dwelling a little bit on Zorga's personality because he was reckless, wasn't he? Uh, I call my book An Impeccable Spy, quoting Kim Philby. But in fact, actually, in many ways, his work was very far from impeccable. And in fact, he was more or less the opposite of, of a disciplined, low-key, undercover agent. He was a larger-than-life character. And his great um, hobbies were getting drunk and driving his very powerful motorcycle at high speed through the nighttime streets of Shanghai and later Tokyo, crashing it on a frequent basis. On the night of Operation Barbarossa, we're going to talk about this later, he stands up in the middle of a room of Nazis and says, Hitler is a bandit, this is the end of the Third Reich, mm. you know, Stalin is a great man, and because he is so convincing, because he's such a larger-than-life character, all the sort of assembled Nazis around him say, like, sort of, ha, 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 crazy old Richard. Uh, the point is, and it's absolutely central to his persona and his success as, um, as a spy, is that people absolutely believed and trusted him. And again, rather like Kim Philby, his extrovert alcoholism was in fact a species of cover. Because mm. no one could believe that somebody was, who was so outrageous, so outspoken, so, so, so someone who, was, who, who, who didn't fit into the German diplomatic world at all, and he was, in fact, a journalist. He was hiding in plain sight. And that's the definition of his career. He hid in plain sight. But this he is, never this pretended is to be anything other than what he was. Yeah, because this idea we have of spies living in the shadows, working in the shadows. I suppose this is the uh, the idea that we have very strongly today of like the MI6 building we might see on the banks of the River Thames. But what goes on beyond there is a, is a mystery. In a way, this is inside out because the MI6 building in, in the Zorga um, example has been turned out into the streets and is having a drink in Soho. One of the most important things, uh, I mean, you, you, you mentioned a moment ago that he was a man of his time. One of, the, one of the crucial things that actually allowed him to form these very strong bonds of trust and friendship with men of Germans of his generation was uh, what the Germans called Kampfkamerade, the, the, the comradeship of the trenches, mm. because he was of, of that generation. He was 18 years old. At the beginning of the war, he, was, he volunteered immediately for a student battalion. He was wounded three times, once on the Western Front, twice on the Eastern Front. He had a, you know, he, he went through all that the nightmare of, of, of World War I. And as well as being the wellspring of his later political convictions, but it was also the wellspring of that sort of trust relationship that he immediately formed with all the men of that generation who'd been through that common experience. Mm. Um, and, and it was the, the basis of his relationship with the German ambassador, Eugen Ott. It was the basis of his friendship with various military attaches who passed him with important, incredibly important secrets. And really, most importantly of all, he had this persona of the sort of the hard-living, hard-drinking Berlin journalist. 
which was precisely what he was. He was actually born in Baku in the Russian Empire, but he spent most of his childhood in, in Berlin. He was indeed a journalist. He contributed to a variety of publications, the Frankfurter Zeitung, which was the most prestigious paper in Germany at the time. So that, that sort of larger than life persona and the Kampf camaraderie together formed a completely coherent picture, which was immediately comprehensible to the people, to the men who trusted him. Mm. And also there's a further very interesting element, which I think is universally important to all kind of considerations of spying, is the sort of self-reinforcing nature of reputation. Because he was trusted by Ott, then others trusted him. There's a second secretary, a third secretary that arrives just before the war in 1939, 1940, who describes meeting Zorge at a reception and thinking, who is this like weird, outrageous, super familiar guy? And then being told, oh, well, that's Zorge. Like he's has you know, the ear of the ambassador and he's, you know, he's one of the most knowledgeable people about Japanese politics and all that. So reputation has become self-reinforcing, mm-hmm. you know, because one person chooses to trust Zorge everybody follows. And I should probably clarify something at this point, which is a very, very simple point. Who was he working for? Zorge was working as a staff spy. He was an intelligence officer. He wasn't an agent. He was an intelligence officer working for for Soviet military intelligence. At the beginning of his espionage career, he was really born in the turmoil that followed the First World War. Because he came back from the trenches, um, he had an ideological conversion there. In fact, almost exactly the same ideological conversion that's described by his near contemporary Adolf Hitler in his 1925 memoir, Mein Kampf, which was this profound revulsion at the corruption and the stupidity of the old world that, has, that had created what the Germans called the Kinder Mord, the massacre of the innocents, uh, that was the First World War. And this profound visceral revulsion and ang- passionate anger that Hitler describes and is the wellspring of his national socialism becomes the wellspring of Zorge's socialism. So he becomes a dedicated communist. He's involved in the, com- the German Communist Party. He's involved in various attempted revolutions um, through 1918, 1920. But the point was that Zorge went to Moscow for the first time, the ideological home of communism in 1925 as a member of the Communist International. He worked briefly for the Communist International as uh, an intelligence agent. And then he was recruited from the ruins of the Communist International in the late 1920s by Soviet military intelligence. And he was trained and deployed as an officer first in Shanghai in 1930, and then later in Tokyo. I suppose maybe in a more conventional era, had he been born in 1945, for example, he might well have just ended up as a professor in a university. I think that's certainly true. He, 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 had, he had a highly inflated sense of his, own, uh, of his own brilliance. And I think, actually, one of the, one of the great commentaries on his life is, uh, was written by John le Carré, who actually wrote a, uh, a brilliant review of the first ever book written in English in 1966. Le Carré says of Zorge, he was an entertainer. People, even his victims, loved him. Soldiers warmed to him immediately. He was a man's man, and like most self-appointed romantics, had no use for women outside the bedroom. He was an exhibitionist, I suspect, and the audience was always of his own sex. He had courage, great courage, and a romantic sense of mission. When his colleagues were arrested, he lay in bed drinking sake, waiting for the end. He wanted to train as a singer. He is not the first spy to be recruited from the ranks of failed artists. A French journalist describes him as possessing a strange combination of charm and brutality. At times, he undoubtedly betrayed the symptoms of an alcoholic. These, went, these then were the characteristics he brought to spying. What did spying give to him? A stage, I think. A ship to sail upon his own romantic seas. A string to tie together a bunch of middle-range talents. A fool's bladder with which to beat society and a Marxist whip with which to scourge himself. This sensual priest had found his real métier. He was born wonderfully in his own century. Only his gods were out of date. I think it's difficult to improve on that description of him. So I'm going to ask you now a question we ask of every single person who comes on this podcast. If you could go back in time to a particular year to see Zorga in action, which one would you pick? It would be Zorga in 1941. Now tell us why, 19, why 1941. 
One of the most extraordinary things about looking at this whole story is that if you discard hindsight, you realize that between 1939 and 1941, the first, what we conventionally regard as the first two years of World War II, it was not at all clear who was going to be on which side. Russia and Germany were allies for those first two years of the war. Japan was, even well into 1941, trying to negotiate a non-aggression pact with America. So if you think of the world and the stakes, you have a world war that's been raging in some ways in Asia, right in, you know, from as, as, as early as 1930, because the Japanese have been at war with uh, on mainland China since that time. You have a man who is working for the communists, stationed in the, in the capital of Imperial Japan. And the burning question for a Soviet spy in Tokyo in 1941 is, will Japan join the war? Will Japan attack Russia? And until June of 1941, Russia and Germany are in a non-aggression pact, effectively a military alliance. I should give some context to the listener here because we're sat around a card table in the, in the Garrick. And basically what you're describing is, um, if we're to think about the war, it's, it's a game where not all of the pieces are yet in play. There's things to be decided. Stalin and Hitler basically secretly agreed to carve up Eastern Europe. It's, you know, Poland, the Baltics and so on. They had joint parades in Brest, for instance, to celebrate the uh, their mutual annexation of Poland. Crucially, there's a massive economic part of it because the reason why Hitler wanted an alliance with the Soviets in 1939 was because he was dealing with the consequences of a Royal Navy blockade, a maritime naval blockade of Germany, and he had to have access to raw materials, soybeans, rubber, and so on. And the only way for Germany to get that access was overland via the Trans-Manchurian, Trans-Siberian Railway. Vyacheslav Molotov, after the war, always insisted that Stalin knew and anticipated an attack and, 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 and it was buying time and buying yeah. space. What's incontrovertible is that there is a, you know, a document which has been which is amended by several successive chiefs of the general staff, a plan for a Soviet invasion of Germany. And they have, I mean, I suppose the job of militaries is to plan for all possible contingencies. It doesn't necessarily mean that Stalin was actually planning to do it. But let's say the German plan to invade Britain, British and Sea Lion, went ahead. Hitler were to get bogged down in an invasion of Britain. You know, it's not inconceivable that mm. the Soviet Union, which then had a much larger, numerically larger army than Germany's, they, they could have invaded Germany at that point. Could you characterise that spy network for us? Was it, was it working well or was it fraying at the edges? Early 1941. It was working fairly well. Uh, certainly the Tokyo part of it, the part that depended on Zorge, was working very well. He had a very close relationship with Eugen Ott, with the German ambassador. By 1941, he's has an office in the German embassy in Tokyo for which he produces a daily digest of news. He also looks at all the overnight secret coded cables and has breakfast every morning with the German ambassador Mm -hmm. in which they discuss latest strategic developments inside Japan internationally. And Ott has become very reliant on Zorge by this time because Zorge is amazingly well informed about the ins and outs of Japanese politics. Yeah. And the reason why he's so well informed <laughs> is because he has a spy in working for him, uh, the Hotsumi Ozaki. In your book, there was an example you mentioned from 1941, and that's when Joseph Meisinger, is that how uh-huh. it's pronounced? Yeah. And he's and one of these atrocious Nazis in the history of, of the Second World War, the butcher of Warsaw, incredibly ruthless. Well, indeed, Joseph Meisinger was a Gestapo colonel, and he uh, achieved the rare distinction of ordering such atrocities in occupied Krakow and Warsaw that the Gestapo want to, to prosecute him for war crimes, mm. which I think we can agree is a high bar. Yeah. But the, uh, he managed it, and he, um, they called him the Butcher of Warsaw. So he escaped prosecution, and Meisinger was sent as a police attaché to Tokyo with one job, and that was to investigate this journalist, Richard Zorge. So they send the Butcher of Warsaw by submarine, by the way, like a bacillus insulated halfway around the world to Tokyo 
to report on Zorge. And this man is, you know, clearly a fundamental, terrifying existential threat to Zorge. And yet, within just you know, one night, Zorge does what he does with, with, with all sort of visiting German officers. He takes him out for like an evening of drinking and whoring in, in Ginza. And, 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 and they and you know, they, it turns out they fought in the same battle in, the second, in, in 1915 and the Kampf Kamerade kicks in. And Joseph Meisinger, the, the butcher of Warsaw who is sent to neutralize Zorge, is immediately charmed and thinks that, and when Zorge is finally arrested, sorry, a bit of a spoiler there, but uh, when Zorge is finally arrested at the end of his, uh, at the end of 1941, Meisinger is one of the last to believe it. He can't believe that his mate Richard Zorge is actually a Soviet spy. Mm. Well, let's get on because we've, I think, given the context of 1941, we've got a real strong sense of Zorge's personality now. So let's go to your first scene. Where would you like to go to, please? Uh, I would like to go to a um, the lobby of the Imperial Hotel, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright in neo-Aztec style, the smartest and most Western hotel in Tokyo. And it's uh, the 31st it's, of it's May. The, it's the 31st of May. And uh, Zorge is meeting uh, a, ver a very old friend, a man called Schoen, who was a former military attaché in Tokyo, an old bottle mate of Zorge's. And uh, Erwin Scholl has just come back from Berlin en route to uh, a posting in the, in the Far East. And he is bearing the very latest news on Operation Barbarossa, the latest gossip from Berlin. Scholl has just got in on, on the boat from Vladivostok, where he's just got off the train from Berlin. So Zorge is waiting to hear confirmation of the rumours that he's been following with extreme concern for the previous few months. What we're witnessing here basically is the climactic scene in a way for Zorga after months of rumour. Is this the confirmation at last do you think? It is the confirmation because Scholl and various other friends um, have been communicating with Zorge. Um, Ott has been dropping hints various pieces of the puzzle are coming into focus for Zorge. And what's already been clear to Zorge right from the beginning of the year, from as early as January or February, is that there is a plan afoot to, invest, to, uh, to invade the Soviet Union. And the pieces of the puzzle that fall into place over subsequent months are the, the battle plan the outline of which army group is going to hit which part of the Soviet Union, how many divisions are going to be deployed, the various sort of diversionary tactics. So from various of, of these military officers with whom he's been good friends over the years, he hears different parts of the puzzle. Uh, the only th part of the puzzle that is not clear is when. And it's not clear, partly because it's not also clear to the Germans, because the Germans themselves postponed Barbarossa several times. Um, the original plan of Barbarossa was actually to go in, in May, in fact, which would have been the sensible time to go, right at the beginning of May, so you have a whole summer fighting season. In the end, it gets delayed because Hitler decides to have a swipe at Yugoslavia, so it distracts, loses crucial time. But uh, this meeting at the end of May, it's really clear that Scholl is bringing the latest news of a very imminent attack. You describe it in a nice sentence in the book as deadly jeopardy massed on the western border of the Soviet Union. This is, in terms of uh, ge global geopolitics, a really big moment, enormous anxiety, and it's reduced, it's distilled down to this little scene in a hotel in Tokyo, two friends talking. In a way, we're not familiar with the name Ricardo Zorge over here, but I think he's much more, uh, much better known in Russia. The one thing people generally do know about him is he warned Stalin about Operation Barbarossa before it happened. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and that is indeed the, the one thing that most people know about um, Zorga, if they know anything about him. One of the interesting things is that he was in fact one of 19 agents who warned the Soviets in various ways, shape of, shapes and forms. There were a group of people in of agents all around the German 
military and political establishment within the Luftwaffe, within the foreign ministry and so on, uh, collectively called the Rote Kapelle, the, the, the Red Choir, who had been reporting pretty much the same things, like bits, important bits of the picture, mobilization, troop movements and so on and so forth, to Stalin. Or rather, and this is a really crucial point, um, they've been reporting, them, reporting it to Stalin's chief of military intelligence, a man called General Philip Gorlikov. And one of the things that makes this meeting that we're talking about on at the Imperial Hotel incredibly poignant is that Zorge has been spending the last few months sending this information to his bosses in Moscow. And they have been made it very clear that they do not believe him, mm. that they distrust his information. And the reason why they distrust his information is that Philip Gorlikov is the seventh head of Soviet military intelligence in five years. And his six predecessors have all been denounced and executed. Mm. So it's a very urgent priority if you are in that job to tell the boss what he wants to hear. Mm. If your if your intention is to stay alive, so you have this terrifying this 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 terrible situation whereby you have a self reinforcing cycle of disbelief, and Golikov is cherry picking all of the, the bits of information that disprove the existence of Barbarossa, telling them passing those to the boss, Stalin's prejudice and conviction that, that there is not going to be an invasion is reinforced and thereby the circle of ignorance just deepens. And this is a suitably global scene for us or a moment for us to be analysing because you're talking about the build-up of military forces on the borders of the Soviet Union being discussed in this hotel in Tokyo, being interpreted in Moscow by Golikov who's sceptical or maybe who knows if he's sceptical or not, maybe that's too much for me to say because he's maybe just trying to stay alive by telling his boss what his boss wants to hear. So it's an incredibly complicated scene in a way. You write in the book, this is a quote actually, but I think it frames it really nicely. A good spy can decide the outcome of a battle or the course of crucial negotiations, but of course only if he is believed. It's a very difficult psychological state when you're not believed when you have obtained secret information that turned out to be right. And this is the dilemma, isn't it, that follows this meeting? Or maybe even as he's getting the confirmation, I suppose my question would be, at this point, at the end of May in 1941, is he valued as an agent, Zorga? Uh, in order to answer that question, you have to dial back a little bit to understand the climate of distrust and fear that has become totally pervasive in all organs of Soviet intelligence since 1937. 1937 is the year of the Great Purge, mm -hmm. when Stalin arrests and executes hundreds of thousands of members of the party, top to bottom. And also the purge spreads to the security organs. By 1938, every single Soviet agent, including Zorge, around the world has been summoned back for, to Moscow for cons consultations. Every single one of those spies, including the most brilliant spies of their generation, Theodore Marley, the recruiter of, of, of the Cambridge Five, the, the great legendary Soviet illegals of the 1920s and 30s, every single one of them that goes back, that, that obeys the order and goes back, is either arrested or shot. Every one of them that disobeys the order and remains on post is hunted down, with one exception, over the subsequent years and murdered by the NKVD. Only one of them survives, and that is Richard Zorge, because he agrees to go, but then doesn't go. He says, yes, I will go, but I'm waiting for you know, my, you know, Ozaki is in Manchuria, and I have to wait for him to come back. And, and by the time he's ready to go back, the boss who summoned him has been shot. The, boss, the successor of the boss who summoned him has also been shot. The, they're now on to like the third boss in the summer of 1938, who doesn't want him to come back. So Zorge is what they call in Russian a nevozrashenets, a person who has not returned. So you have this bizarre situation whereby he is uh, not trusted as somebody who had been under some kind of suspicion in 1937-38. Everyone who remembers what that suspicion may have been is, be is long dead. But nonetheless, there's this cloud of distrust that hangs over Zorge's head. But at the same time, he remains in his post. 
he's still supplying them with, with information, he's still getting money from Moscow. And it, it, you have to understand when everyone is distrusted, when, when everyone knows that these accusations are basically sort of lies and nonsense, then you understand that the answer to your question is Zorge was both trusted and distrusted yeah. by 1941 because they distrusted everybody. That was, the, that was the modus operandi. But on the other hand, they were sufficiently professional to realise good information when they saw it and you know, verifiable you know, official yeah. secrets. And this is, I suppose, what I'm trying to get at because he is in possession of some dynamite intelligence here. He has, from a very, very good source, confirmed this is going to be an invasion of the USSR. You know, the kind of thing that happens once in a career. It's it's interesting to judge, like, kind of... I mean, this is quite an Ian Fleming-ish um, a scene you've given us to look at here, because here they are in the Imperial Hotel. It couldn't have a better name. I think you described them, though. They have to eat this steak, which is named after a Russian... Alash, Alash yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and there's nothing that can be done with this intelligence until they've gone through the formalities of getting drunk, going to the whorehouses, whatever they do on a night out in Tokyo. So he's got to kind of keep this bottled up. But then he has, waking up with a sore head the next morning, the absolute dilemma of trying to, one, get this like information to Moscow safely, and two, presenting it in a way which is going to be noticed. All of that, I think, condensed into this scene. I think it just makes it incredibly charged and interesting to look down on it. One thing I haven't asked you yet, but it's nice just to have a visual, you know, something to plant a, a picture in their listener's mind. What does Zorga look like? Tell us. Well, he was incredibly good looking. Um, he was tall, six foot two. He was, uh, in his youth, sort of classic German good looks, very Aryan. Uh, in later life, had this sort of unalcoholics kind of cragginess came out from all his sort of ravaged face and his hard living. He was also visibly wounded because his one of the, one leg was shorter than the other because of yeah. shrapnel wounds. So he always had a limp. He was missing part of, he had to have shrapnel wounds in his hands. He was missing part of a finger. So he was obviously not just sort of a handsome at all, but also a, a hero. Yes, yeah. he was like a sort of obviously a war hero yeah. as well. And um, gave me an iron cross in return. Right, yeah. exactly. And he was... Uh, quite sporty in fact I mean he, he, he would he would do his, his, his exercises and his chest expanding and so on in the mornings so he was actually in, in reasonable physical shape despite being what we'd now describe as a high functioning alcoholic and um, he was extraordinarily intense um, and extremely attractive to women I mean the the Americans uh, who looked into the case after the war estimated that he had had um, uh, 30 affairs while during his time in Tokyo over nine years. Mm. I don't know whether that's a lot or a little, depending on your standards, but nonetheless, you know, he was undoubtedly extremely attractive, irresistible to women. He would describe himself, and we talked about his sort of almost delusional sense of self-worth and and his tendency to romanticise himself, but he regularly described himself as a robber baron or as a a ravaged robber baron. Mm. And you can see from the photographs that he has this ravaged Rue's I have to, I have to give the, the book a plug here because it's some wonderful photographic portraits of him. I think there's one of him after he had one of his many motorcycle crashes where he just looks, I don't know, he looks... Uh... Well, he definitely has an interesting face. <laughs> I think that's, that's, that's true. true. I mean, this is a man that's lived. We're going to get to your second scene in just a moment, but I think in between times it's worth filling in a tiny gap because um, the message that goes off to Moscow and as you predicted, Golikov, am I pronouncing that reasonably well, yes. asks for more information. It's a typical, I don't quite believe you, I might believe you, it's a bit of a dissembling one. Mm-hmm. And there's um, an interesting strategy that he's driven to by leaking to members of the American press yes. in Tokyo um, news of Barbarossa because he's in despair because he knows this thing and it's not being taken seriously. And to be in possession of a secret like that is it must be beyond disturbing for someone who's an ideologue like him. Mm-hmm. So that's the in-between description. Scene two. Scene two is, uh, again, at the Imperial Hotel. It's the evening of the first day of Operation Barbarossa. Sunday, 22nd of June, 1941. He had gone out for a picnic in the countryside in the morning and heard the news on the radio as the German aircraft and tanks ripped into Soviet Belarusia. How did the news arrive? I mean, this might be a very... 
a simple so, question. How on, did on news radio, arrive? On the, on the radio, it was, it was announced publicly. On the, and was on the this radio. Goebbels making an address, or would it be...? Uh, well, actually, Goebbels, in fact, did make an address. Well, firstly, the Molotov um, address to Soviet people that, that, that afternoon, saying there's been an attack. Goebbels made a very impassioned um, speech saying that you know the the scourge of international Bolshevism is is about to be destroyed, wiped from the face of the earth. For for Zorge, it was obviously an incredibly bitter, sweet moment because I mean, well, incredibly bitter irony because I told you, it, so. you know I told you so. Everything that he'd been transmitting was immediately proved right. And can um, we like quantify that just for a moment? What was Operation Barbarossa in a in a military sense? What is happening on the you know on the twenty second of June, nineteen forty one? on well, the western border of the USSR. The Wehrmacht had assembled something like 112 divisions on a 900 kilometer long front, which went from, from Tallinn in the Baltic to near, near Constanza in, in, in the, on the border of Soviet Ukraine. And the idea was three massive blitzkrieg-like attacks, one through the Baltics, one right through the middle of central Russia towards Smolensk, the third across the, the exact the, tactics the, the, the that had worked in Western... Yes, the, across, across the, the plains of, of Ukraine. And these, these three army groups were just ordered to... Uh, they were massively well-equipped and well-fueled. And their orders were just to push on at all costs and not wait to mop up resistance. And the result was that these three prongs advanced extremely quickly, essentially marooning gigantic swathes of up to four million Soviet troops found themselves behind enemy lines in the, in, the, in, the first, in the first few weeks of the war. So Zorge, on hearing this, falls into depression, fury, fury at his bosses, they didn't believe him, fury at Hitler for launching this treacherous attack. On a very basic level, a sort of personal anguish because his fatherland was attacking his motherland we haven't mentioned this, but Zorge's mother was Russian. And although she didn't speak to him in Russian, he only learned Russian later when he was in Moscow in the mid-20s. He was born in the Russian Empire into a the family of an expatriate German uh, engineer turned later banker. He always saw himself as an outsider during his childhood because of his exotic non-German early childhood and the fact that he wasn't you know, only half a German. So in the most literal sense, his motherland was being attacked by his fatherland. Exactly, and then you've got this personal dilemma in a way to match the political one that he has, because if there's an attack on the USSR, this goes very, you know, back into what he is, you know. But, but it would also because I think, I think every spy convinces themselves that they're some a species of patriot. Zorge certainly saw himself as in many ways, a German patriot in saving Germany from Nazism. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's not a totally illogical yeah. position. But now, when those two countries are literally at war, then he really is forced to pick sides. Yeah. And I think there's, there's no, there, there is no calculation because he is incredibly reckless because what he does is he gets incredibly drunk and starts shouting that Hitler is a bandit. This is going to be the end of the Third Reich. And he starts declaiming to a room full of Nazis, Hitler is, is finished. So I, I think there's no caution there at all. I think it's just his natural fury. And given that he's, as far as I'm aware, the only person in history to have been simultaneously a member of the Soviet Communist Party and the German Nazi Party. So um, during that moment in his drunken fury, he just literally throws caution to the wind and, and inveigles against... When I mean, got... he, he doesn't say, I am a Soviet spy. He doesn't yeah. go quite that far. Yeah. But, none, but almost. You know, he, he, he says, you know, that Stalin's going, going to destroy you. But all of this is just a sign of how far on the edge is. Because when you've got the butcher of Warsaw checking you out, as he surely knows at this point, and ostensibly he, here he is, the writer of articles for the German newspaper in the hotel shouting Hitler is finished. This is quite a thing to witness, I imagine. He's so, he's so trusted and he's so well known for his outrageous views that all the Nazis in the room just say like, oh, you know, crazy old Richard, like ha ha ha, like he's off it again. And also he had not been shy previously in praising Stalin. There's, there's a one point he's, he's in a car with his friends and they drive past the Soviet embassy. And the young diplomat who's driving says, like, let's go and see your friends in the Soviet embassy. Teasing Zorge for his, for his admiration of Stalin. You know, so it's, it's, it's well known that despite the fact that he's a, he's a Nazi, he admires Stalin, which was sort of OK until 22nd of June 1941, at which point the two countries were, in fact, 
not no longer analyzed, but at war, and that became a much more controversial yeah, it's, uh, it's the position. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know really what more there is to say about that scene, apart from the fact it'd be a hell of a thing to witness to see him in full flow yes. on the day that Barbarossa was unleashed. Yes. Can you think of anything more to say? I think that's <laughs> probably best left to the imagination. Hi, I'm Artemis, one of the presenters on the Travels Through Time podcast. Over the past few weeks, you'll notice that we've started our working partnership with the brilliant photo colorist Dynamochrome. If you're interested in history, you've probably already spent some time looking at colorized photographs online. They're such cool works of art. What we love about them is that they transport you back to a moment in the past that you can experience, not in black and white, but in a way that's close to how they were originally seen. It might be the flash of gold on Abraham Lincoln's watch chain or the purple sheen of a Japanese warrior's chest plate. These little details can evoke entire worlds and there's so many of them to enjoy and be provoked by in Jordan Lloyd's fabulous colorization work. If you want to see some of it for yourself, please do visit tttpodcast.com slash dynamochrome. Let's go to your third scene then. What would you like to go for your third scene in 1941 then? From the moment that Barbarossa is launched, Zorge is proved right. The attitude of his spy masters in Moscow changes completely. Because indeed, 100 divisions crossing the Soviet border is quite a major, hard to ignore piece of evidence, conf- confirmationary evidence that, in fact, maybe Zorge may have been onto something all along. And the question on day one of the Soviet invasion becomes for Zorge, what is Japan going to do? Because And this, rather than warning Stalin of Operation Barbarossa, lots of people warn Stalin about Operation Barbarossa, but Zorge's real espionage triumph and the really key strategic piece of intelligence that he provided in his career, that world history changing thing, was confirmation eventually that the Japanese would not invade the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941. And that is enormously important because I think it's, it's very clear that Stalin only just survived fighting a war on one front in 1941. And the Soviet Union was within days, within the, the, literally you know, single figure kilometers of collapsing. Had the Germans actually taken Moscow in early November 1941, it would have been game over. And I think it's very clear that Stalin could not have survived fighting a war on two fronts. Mm. And uh, at that moment, uh, a very glamorous uh, German refugee shows up in uh, the um, German embassy uh, in, in Tokyo. She's a, she's a friend of a friend of uh, Helmer Ott. So this is ambassador's wife. So this is your third scene, I'll say it, so we've got the clarity. Yes. It's one night in August 1941, because we can't be sure exactly. Her full name is Margareta, but Etta mm-hmm. for short, and she's a harpsichordist, is that right? Mm-hmm. This is a wonderful material, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit. I mean, if we are looking at them meeting together in 1941 in August, um, can you just characterise the two of them together? What kind of relationship are they having at that time? So uh, Margareta Harry Schneider, um, Etta, is um, a house guest of the Ots of the ambassador. And she's staying there as a sort of celebrity pet, as a sort of, uh, she, the, the Ots are very proud of having her to play for their parties and so on. She's quite a celebrated harpsichordist in Germany. She's, uh, um, she's in fact fleeing, although, although the Ots don't know that. One of her professors was, uh, was Jewish, her children, were part Jewish. She was lonely. She was irritated by the arts. She was charmed and fascinated by Zorge, by this sort of dark, rugged character. And uh, also she's very beautiful. Very rapidly, uh, she falls under Zorge's spell and he seduces her. But not totally coincidentally, the room that Margareta is, is staying in is requisitioned as the Gestapo headquarters and the embassy. Her, her room key is going to be the key to Joseph Meissinger, the Butcher of Warsaw's office. So it's rather important for Zorge to get her key, <laughs> not for anything else. So he's not, it's not entirely sort of just a romantic thing. So she, he actually persuades Etta to steal the key 
uh, give it to him to be copied. And, and, and thereafter, every time he goes to the embassy, he's able to slip into Etta's former room, now Meissinger's office, and read the files that Meissinger is writing about him. Well, I said there's <laughs> Ian Flemish about the first scene. Well, this one, and you describe it. So here she is. Um, he's in a brooding mood. She pulls a harpsichord out, mm. plays Moonlight Sonata well, in by fact, candlelight. That's that's right. Although actually, um, <laughs> technically speaking, uh, I, I, I did. Uh, it's actually impossible to play the Moonlight Sonata on a harpsichord. Well, I've learned something today. You, you, well, I mean, you can, but it was it's, it was just sound weird. Imperfect. She, well, it would just sound weird. Uh, but so in fact, she played she played it on a grand piano. Oh, okay. so, <laughs> um, but there, there was definitely candlelight. There, there was, was definitely, definitely an empty exactly. ballroom. So, 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 so she's there in an empty ballroom. I mean, if you can play a harpsichord, you can play a grand, grand piano, obviously. So um, she's serenading him, and he's under an enormous amount of stress. I mean, again, she has no idea of his real career, but um, she realizes that this is a man in a lot of psychological stress and pain. And so they have this moment of sort of romantic quiet where Etta is serenading him in the empty ballroom by candlelight, by playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. It's a, it's a very tender moment because, in fact, if there's anyone to whom Zorge really opens up at that very light, the, the end of his career, it's probably to Etta, much more so, by the way, than to his Japanese Did she write a memoir? There was a very extensive biographical interview with her that so it's well documented. It's well documented. Yeah. yeah so. And then he slips next door and plunges into the official records. Yes, and, and, and he uses the opportunity to check up to see what the butcher of Warsaw has been has been writing about it. But of course he did get intelligence back to Stalin about um, the Japanese plans. So yes. Right. Uh, Zorge is able to confirm that at the end of August there is um, an extremely rare, almost unheard of imperial audience. The emperor himself meets with his top generals. It, it's at that moment, it takes Zorge a bit of time to, for, for, for the details to filter through, but he's able to confirm that the strategic decision has been made, that Japan cannot invade the Soviet Union that summer. It's not going to happen. And that information becomes enormously strategically important because the Soviet Union is then able, the, the Soviet general staff makes it very fateful decision, and that is to withdraw up to five army corps from the, the Soviet Far East, from the defense of Siberia, of Eastern Siberia against the Japanese, to the defense of Moscow, leaving the Soviet Far East almost undefended, but based on the knowledge that... that, that and you described that already how close a run thing that was. And it was those Siberian troops that came in the very last days of October and early November that saved Moscow. Because obviously we started this process of looking at 1941 with him and the dilemma of not being believed and we're ending it with a moment when he's dispatching intelligence to Moscow which if he'd done nothing else alters the course of history. That's right. that's a fair point isn't it? Exactly. Um, at this moment, because like there's a few times in the book when you actually take us to Stalin, you know, after you know we go through Golikov and get Stalin, and we see him reading these reports, and you describe them as giving you goosebumps when you look at that waxy crayon moving yes. over the paper. It's almost like a ghost that haunts the pages in the archives today. Yes. Did Stalin appreciate the work that was done by 1941, by August of that year, or is it too difficult to? person to read? Well, I, I think um, it's hard to say whether he appreciated it or not, but certainly they believed it and they acted on it, mm -hmm. um, on that information. When you go through the archives and you leaf through them, Stalin has a very distinctive handwriting and, and he always uses either blue or red wax pencil. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure it's a curious it. choice in a way. And these documents, they all have circulation lists, and so you see who read them and, you know, and, and you will see ST, Stalin, ST. He signs himself, and he writes often quite rude things. Immediately on the, in the run up to Barbarossa, one of the messages that Zorge is sending, he, he writes, "You can send your source to his mother," <laughs> and, because he doesn't believe some bit of information. But did, did Stalin appreciate Zorge? Ultimately, I don't think he did. For one very simple reason is that when Zorge was finally arrested, the entire intelligence apparatus immediately forgot about him. But it's fair as well to say that today in Russia, 
is remembered as a hero in a way. That's certainly true. He's been brought to life in a television series recently. Is that correct? Well, there might be a film when they when they pick up on your book. Well, the, the, the story is that Zorge was arrested and kept by the Japanese in jail for three years. He confessed at great length but not always truthfully, and he was expecting to be rescued or swapped or somehow sprung from prison right up to the end, more or less. But the Soviets themselves essentially ignored him. It was only really in 1962 when there was a film made about Zorge's life by a Franco-German director called Who Are You, Dr. Zorge, that was shown at the Moscow International Film Festival, which was seen by Khrushchev, and Khrushchev, and actually, strangely enough, Philip Golikov, who was still alive, was also in the audience. Oh, is this when you have him in, in the book standing up saying, yes. that's not how it was? Exactly, yes. <laughs> Golikov was at the, Exactly at that moment, Soviet propaganda, the, uh, there was the Berlin crisis, Kennedy talking about the bulwark of freedom and so on, that he'd be an Berliner. The Berlin Wall is just about to go up. So Soviet propaganda needs a good German. Yeah a good anti-communist German hero. So he came into very Pro-Soviet. So he becomes, overnight, an official Soviet hero. And then there's another moment in the late 70s where Zorge sort of again has another sort of moment of, of official um, sort of heroism and boosterism. And that's when Yuri Andropov is manoeuvring in the very last years of Brezhnev. Andropov was chairman of the KGB. So what the, and the Soviet Union needed, the, and, and the KGB and Andropov needed, like the sort of Soviet James Bond, uh, a hero KGB man. So he's again sort of big up. So he's like had a few incarnations. Few, few but incarnations. I think what we've seen today, or listened to today, if you like, is, this is the climax of his career, isn't it? Barbarossa and warning that the Japanese are not going to invade from the east. Correct. And... Wow, those are two pretty big things for a CV. It's been a real pleasure talking to you about a really, really fascinating person who makes a brilliant biographical study in the book. But we've got one question before we release you back into 2020, which is if you could bring an object back, a tangible object back to today from 1941, Mm -hmm. is there anything you'd like? Yeah, um, Zorge's lighter. (laughs) <laughs> Could you give us any more? Just why would you like his lighter? Was there something interesting about it? Or? Well, the fact that his lighter has been is, is presumably present at every yeah. juncture of his it's life. In such close proximity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's, he's you know he's been flicking that lighter at various crucial moments of his career. Yeah, um, it almost be worth taking up smoking <laughs> for again it, if you had his lighter. Well, I think that's a really good one. Just yeah, that close proximity to him and the moment that any moment it might. Go up in flames. Yes, exactly. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. It's a wonderful book. A pleasure to talk to you. Pleasure's all mine. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Owen Matthews about his excellent new biography of Ricard Zorge, which is titled An Impeccable Spy. It's been hugely critically acclaimed and it's available in paperback now from Bloomsbury. Please do go and check it out. You don't need me to tell you that we're living in unprecedented and extremely trying times. Maybe in times like this, we look to history more than ever for empathy, for solace and for hope. It was a challenge to record this episode, so I want to say a special thank you to Owen and to everyone at Bloomsbury who helped set it up. If you did enjoy it, then please do let us know with a comment or an email and we'll do our best to bring you some more adventures into the past as soon as it becomes possible again. My very best wishes to you all, wherever you might be listening. Your good health. We'll be back soon. Goodbye. Hello again, I'm Artemis. We've had such a brilliant time talking to a wonderful range of historians throughout this second season of Travels Through Time. From Dan Jones on the Crusades in 1147, we've come all the way through to Owen Matthews on Operation Barbarossa in 1941. In between, there's been everything. Social histories like Sarah Wise on 1889 and Dr Patricia Farrer on 1918. We've had dynastic quarrels like Thomas Penn in 1483 and scientific histories like Professor Giles Gasper back in 1215. All of these and so many more have taught us so much about the past. With the sudden disabling spread of coronavirus around the world, we thought that this was the right time to pause for a few weeks, to take stock of what we do and to spend some time with our families. If you've enjoyed our work over the past six months though, we'd love to hear from you. A comment on our feed, an email through our website or even a tweet You can find us at tttpodcast underscore. We plan to be back for a third season very soon. 
But till then, from Peter, Maria, Violet, John and me, thanks so much for listening and very best wishes to you all.